Welcome to Faithfully Living, the podcast, where we learn how to live for Christ in our daily lives. I am Dwan, your host, and I would like to invite you on a journey with me to explore and learn how to be a faithful follower of Christ. everyone, welcome to Faithfully Living, the podcast, where we strive to encourage you to live for Christ faithfully by offering guidance on studying the Bible, how to understand the Bible better, and how to remain faithful to historic Christianity in a contemporary society. You know, what we believe is important, but why should we as believers view the world differently than unbelievers? In this episode, I talk with Lance Cashin about why it's important to have a biblical worldview. But before we get started with this conversation, let me tell you a little bit about Lance. Lance Cashin is the founder and CEO of the Forge Room Foundation, equipping and mobilizing Christians to engage culture and live courageously. Lance speaks and writes on topics ranging from culture, worldview, and apologetics to human trafficking, pro-life issues, and biblical leadership. He serves on the Tarrant County Five Stone Task Force Steering Committee and several nonprofit advisor, advisory boards in the anti-trafficking and pro-life space. All right, let's dive into today's episode. Hi, Lance. Welcome to the show. Hi, how's it going, Dwan? It's going great. Good. Thank so you be- for having me. No problem. So before we get into our topic about um, worldviews, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes. Yeah, so uh, my name is Lance Cashin, and I am the CEO and founder of the Forge Room Foundation. We uh, launched in almost a year ago, so mm. May, the end of May of 23. And so we've been, a, we're almost a year old. We're still a toddler. And um, I was on church staff as a local outreach pastor at a church here in Fort Worth for nine years. Mm -hmm. And I just oversaw domestic outreach partnerships with nonprofits, really focusing on equipping and deploying, mobilizing and deploying the people of my church into all areas of ministry. We had specific focus areas and, you know, pro-life and serving those experiencing homelessness, um, refugees, asylees, um, traffic, human trafficking um, situation that's prevalent here in North Texas, um, and a lot of other areas. And so it was an exciting nine years. And uh, prior to that, I had a wealth management firm and an insurance marketing company. Um, prior to that, I was in the music business, uh, but mm-hmm. I live here in Fort Worth with my wife and two children. And um, just pursuing what God has for me through the Forge Room Foundation, which is an equipping ministry. We we believe that we we're um, to help Christians develop worldview knowledge in order to um, have real world impact right in our own community. And Mm -hmm. so we forge Christians who shape culture right here in uh, the Fort Worth area. So that's that's a bit about me. All right. Well, that kind of dives into our topic about having a biblical worldview because you know there's a lot of competing ideas in our world today and right they're floating around so kind of let's start at the ground level what are some core beliefs or principles that define a biblical worldview well i think if we back up just just a little bit and describe well, what makes up a, a worldview in general and then move into what a biblical worldview so a worldview is is a lens through which every human being sees the world. It's generally um, uh, developed uh, from age five to fourteen to you know sixteen years old. Somewhere in those teenage years, your your worldview starts to solidify. And what a worldview is 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 um, how you see yourself in the world around you. It's your perception of the world reality and everything around you. And it answers anywhere, depending on who you speak with, four to eight different questions. I try to land somewhere in the middle of origin, meaning, morality, identity, and destiny. So, you know, origin, where do we come from? 
you know, the origins. Where, where, where do human beings come from? That's one question. Um, meaning, does life has have meaning? And okay, can we know what life, the meaning of life is? Um, uh, morality, the difference between good and evil. Can we know the difference? Uh, is there a difference um, or is everything relative? Um, or, and then the, another question is identity. What does it mean to be human um, and who am I? And then finally, it's the destiny question. What happens when I die? Now, there's other questions about the nature reality that flow into what uh, constitutes a worldview, but that's essentially it. it and, and every human being has answers to those questions. Now, not everybody claims to have a worldview or know what their worldview is, mm -hmm. but I think that's where it ties into the, the importance of, of Christianity and a biblical worldview is that Christians think this way. And we have for, right. for 2000 years, it's only been recently where we've been having to recover what a biblical worldview is, mm -hmm. I, particularly in the West. But from a, a biblical worldview or a historic Christian worldview is going to answer those five questions through the lens of a Bible. And so the Bible, God's word, we see it as instructive. We see it as inerrant. We see it as authoritative, uh, sufficient for all things, for godliness, salvation, all that. But um, it is not only a book to be read and trusted, but it's also a lens to be looked through. So it's not only a book to be read, but a lens to look through. So when we answer the questions of origin, meaning, morality, identity, and destiny, the Bible gives very clear answers about that. that you know, where did we come from? We're created um, by God and we're created in his image. So there, there's some identity and a lot of that tied into that first question right there. And so what that does is gives unity to the Christian worldview and it and it at, it gives it um, stability, meaning that there's clear meaning that God defines who we are in the world around us. And um, different worldviews will have different answers to each of those questions. Um, an atheist who doesn't believe in God isn't going to say that, oh, God created us in his image. Right. Yeah. And so when you take those worldview questions around origin, meaning, morality, identity, and destiny and work them out logically, they end up in some very different areas. And for the biblical worldview, you know, because we believe the word of God is true about all things, um, you know, when you see it through that lens, and let's just say identity, which is a big issue in our current cultural moment, is uh, a lot of people are asking, who am I and what does it mean to be human? And they're grasping on to different identities and different meanings. You've got everything from transgenderism to transhumanism to all these different types of thinking of what a human being is and what a human being ought to be. Um, well, the, the biblical worldview has an answer to that, a very clear answer. It's not changed. Uh, mm -hmm. and yet, you know, those are the ideas that, that we face as Christians is, is okay. What does the Bible say? How do I have a biblical worldview? How do I make sure that it's very clear? And then how do I articulate it, uh, in a way that not only fortifies my faith, but can also come into contact with those contrary worldviews that are telling people things that are very different than what the word of God says. Right. Um, so that's that's how I approach. Try to keep it as simple as possible, um, because that way, when you're helping people understand biblical worldview, they can remember, and it's it's a part of the story. It's the story that they inhabit, and it's it's who they are and how God created. So it's going to affect their relationships with God themselves, um, others, and then creation. And so it's going to be broader and deeper. So it's very rich. It's very um, uh, stable, meaning that nothing changes with the biblical worldview. And that's you know very comforting that God, God doesn't change. His word doesn't change. Right. We might, <laughs> yeah. but the biblical worldview stands firm. And so we can tell others who um hold to other worldviews when we can respect their position we can understand that the their worldview 
isn't grounded in truth. And there may be kernels of truth there, but uh, at the end of the day, there's something that's disconnected or disjointed from the truth because it's not grounded in the word of God. And so that's where Christians, apologists, and folks like ourselves can come in with truth and love and say, this is this is the biblical worldview and help that person understand where their their worldview might be disjointed or not grounded in truth at all. Right. So. Yeah, that's helpful. So looking at it from that way, kind of maybe breaking it down a little bit more, helping people like navigate the challenges and maybe crisis that they have, how can they, all of those elements of the biblical view, how can it help them, you know, navigate the different challenges they might see, you know, in our culture and world today? Um, I think, well, I think let's, let's, let's take a challenge um, that I've dealt with, with, within my own community and in church um, and just have a concrete example of, um, you know, mm-hmm. an, an individual that, that, is a grandparent of this, their grandchild is struggling with identity. They don't same sex attraction. They don't know if they're transgender, they may have some friends. And so this gets into some very um, sticky situations. And I mean, these are relationships, so it's got to come down to, for me, it's always going to come down. The rubber meets the road in that relationship. And so we can talk about these bigger cultural issues, but most people when when they're thinking of an issue if you can help them ground it into something concrete and usually they have something there that they're dealing with then where does the biblical worldview make contact with that grandchild and you're talking to that grandparent and they're saying you know what do i do how do i approach this as a christian Mm -hmm. well there's no it's not just simple oh do these three things and everything will be fine it's more difficult than that because you're dealing with a relationship. These are real people. And that grandchild is created in the image of God with value, dignity, and worth, but they're confused um, either by their own sin or the lies of the world, um, the, the schemes of, of the enemy or all of the above. Mm -hmm. And yet here's this grandparent trying to be a witness and um, be a light and a beacon of hope and truth into that, child's life so the biblical worldview i think you just start with that that origin and affirm what's already true so with when you think of we think of the bible it's it's always helpful for me to think of it in four chapters creation fall redemption and restoration right and so when when we're dealing with people or any problem we can we can kind of we can not kind of we can apply that lens and say how do I see this issue through creation, fall, redemption, restoration? Oftentimes we're seeing the fall piece of it. We see the sinful right. brokenness and that takes all of our focus. But then I think while that's very important, we have to understand it in a bigger context of, uh, of that lens of creation, fall, redemption, restoration. So along with those four chapters or four stories of the Bible or the greater story of the Bible, there's, there's four questions. So um, creation, add the question to it. What's, what's good that we can um, promote, protect and celebrate. So what's good that we can promote, protect, celebrate Um, fall. What's, what's um, evil that we can stop fight or confront um and then the third question is you know what is uh, missing that we can contribute or create and then the final question being what's broken that we can restore and i think that's the most beautiful question but we have to start at the beginning right before we the restoration so in the context of this you know grandchild um you can as a christian um say this this grandchild is a teenager, 14, 15 years old. Let's Mm -hmm. just put an age to it. So in that context, you can affirm them and who God created them to be. And so uh, approaching that child who's confused, but you still have this connection because you're the grandparent um, to speak into that child's life. You can say, you know, you're created in the image of God. There's only one of you. You are beautiful. You are 
Um, you've got dignity, value, and worth, and there's a purpose in you. Like you, you are, there's only one of you. And so I believe that. And so what you're doing is you're, 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 you're promoting and celebrating what is already true. Like God would say yes. And amen. That is true. That's I've created this child. Um, And then you move into the fall question. It's, it's, it's kind of like, okay, what's, what's evil sinful that we could stop or fight? Well, you don't want to start a fight with this child, obviously, but you're confronting sin, you're confronting brokenness. And that child may be legitimately confused. They may not have acted out on any of this. They may just be so confused and deceived that, okay, so you're dealing with some brokenness here. So that's kind of, you, you look at that as like, okay, I'm dealing, I've identified the, um, either the sin or the, or the brokenness in this individual. Now, how I approach that may be a, a couple of different ways. Well, with a child, you may not say, look, that's a sin, that's evil, you're going to go to hell if you act on this. Mm-hmm. Well, that may be true, right? But this child may have not acted on any of this. They're just confused. Right. And so what you're trying to do is shepherd them toward the truth. So then the next question is redemption. So here comes the beauty, the light is like, what is missing that I can contribute or create? Well, they need to know the truth. And you've already started there with that first question by mm-hmm. promoting what is good and celebrating what is right. good. But what you can can contribute there is further ground their identity and say, you know, human beings, you know, describe, ask them questions like, what does it mean to be human? Like, you know, where do you find your identity? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and getting, getting the individual to interact and share, that's where that door opens up right? Um, and allow them to share what they're believing. And if they can share what they believe, they're almost sharing what they worship in a way. Mm-hmm. And then you've identified again, something that's, that's broken, but also, um, you can then contribute what is true again about how they're created. And that in fact, that there is evil in the world and that there is this thing called sin and brokenness. And why do we get confused about who we are and maybe share a personal example of, of when you've been confused about your own identity was like, I used to think I could be a rock star, or, you know, a great mm-hmm. athlete. I'm like, I'm not that great of an athlete, whatever that may be. And you don't want to trivialize it because right. this is someone who's really dealing, but it, you, you use your own life and your own testimony to share, contribute to that person's life and, and obviously truth into their life. And then ultimately the idea is that is get to that that final question is restoration, what's broken that we can store where their their idea, their identity is is broken as far as it's been untethered from God's story, um, either through mm-hmm. confusion or lifestyle. And then they need to be reoriented around God's truth and who God says they are. And then they need to then be reconciled if they can be reconciled with God, because that's our ministry is reconciliation is working from there. Then when we're reconciled with, with God, then we can reconcile with ourselves. Right. And then it's like, who gets to determine who I am me? Well, that's, that's can be very dangerous and daunting, right? Well, well, if God is who he says he is and he's all powerful, he never changes. And he authored my life. Well, I'd rather trust him on who who right. says I am. He authored my life rather than mm-hmm. me trying to author my life um, because I'm going to make mistakes. But you're reorienting them around God's character, who God says they are. And then just I think prayer is very important because in in that moment, and this isn't just one conversation, I don't think this is right, yeah. you know, over That'd time. Yeah. We're, we're, we're microwaving this thing and turning mm-hmm. it into a few minutes, but that's where that witness and discipleship come in because they may not know Christ. And let's say the child doesn't know Christ. We are just, just mm-hmm. discipling and the shepherd them to the truth. It's God's business on regenerating and, and, and saving that in, individual, even as much as you love them, you can't save them. Right, right. And behavior modification is not redemption, right? So no. even if they do follow like, well, I'm not going to act on that. Well, those are good things, but 
what, what you're ultimately praying for is for that person to repent, turn to Christ and, and be saved, believe and be saved and then walk in the light. Mm-hmm. Um, and that doesn't mean life is going to be perfect for them. They may struggle like Christopher Yuan, who's a friend of mine, um, you know, wrote holy sexuality, struggle with, with same sex attraction his whole life and all that, mm-hmm. you know, he's going to have that struggle that doesn't go away for him. Maybe one day, you know, but what's really interesting is that he walks with God in that. And if we can, is, is that grandparent, if I can just demonstrate the love of Christ and walk with that grandchild through the struggles and through the failures and everything, and just say, I'm going to be a steadfast God willing to demonstrate Christ as his steadfast love. And then pulling it in that worldview frame that, and you've really put your biblical worldview on display and demonstrated rather than in just word, but you've always, you've demonstrated in deed. And so you've, you've, whatever God wants to do with that in that child's life, you don't have control over that, but we're the messenger. We're not, we're not the message and we're not um, the one that, that created the message that's god so that's his business and somebody said i think it was t.s Eliot, uh, basically said that we don't have a ministry of results we have a ministry of trying like our job is to yeah. get up and try <laughs> and leave right. the results to god knowing that he's in charge and his providence and his grace and depend on that and then that way that's what i love about helping people develop that biblical worldview is is you can really help them understand that once they've lived, they live out their biblical worldview and they can articulate it and, and guide and, and help others. Um, that's their job. It, it, the, the results of what the fruit that's up to God And but you can stand back at the end of the day and say, okay, God, I, I, I did what I was obedient. I, I was faithful um, I try to demonstrate your love and articulate my worldview to this grandchild that's struggling, but I can't fix them, nor is that my job. Mm-hmm. Th- that is yours. So I'm going to leave them into your care and your hands. And I pray that you will do your good work in their heart, but I'm going to remain faithful. And you leave it kind of that. And I know that's oversimplifying things. Obviously, it's messy because you're dealing with yeah. with human beings, and we're messy people. But, and I hope that that kind of gives you a an idea of how that might work out, other than giving you theoretical constructs. Yeah. yeah. So that was a good illustration. Is my next question is, you know, how? What are like a couple of ways that a biblical worldview can influence our understanding? Of right and wrong and how it can, you know, guide our ethical decision. But I think you you kind of answered that question as far as like pointing to the Bible. That's going to be our foundation for right. what the truth is. And that should be what guides us in mm-hmm. all of our like decision making and making sure it's pointing us to the right path. Would there be any other like ways that can well, influence I, us? Well, I think. Um... You know, I I think, and you probably find this in your work um, uh, as a nurse and trainer. Like you deal with a lot of people, and I'll, and I, I throw myself in this this category um, where we, in our current age of social media and quick facts and all these type of things, mm-hmm. um, we we lack um, wisdom and discernment, and so coupled with any type of quote unquote worldview or apologetics type of training, cultural intelligence, all those things has to be discernment and wisdom. And I think the practically speaking to sharpen discernment, I mean, I spend a lot of time in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and the book in, in uh, the book of James. And so, you know, because those that's a lot of wisdom, um, it's also helping helping sharp discernment. So discernment isn't necessarily knowing good from evil. It's knowing good from almost good. Somebody right. said, I don't know who said that, but there it's, I probably 
messed up that yeah, quote too, but it's said it, yeah. Yeah, somebody yeah. said that that yeah. was really smart and it's, yeah. and it's true. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's part of our job as Christians, not only to help ourselves um, strengthen our discernment and wisdom, but help others. And I think that happens in community and, and then sharing these challenges that we have and saying, you know, to brother, sister in Christ, like, look, I've got, let's go back to the grandchild or a situation at work or something. Be like, I'm dealing with this and I'm really struggling to discern what I need to be saying or what I need to be doing. Mm -hmm. And then that's where that community can come in and speak to that issue because maybe they've experienced something similar and they have, they can speak from wisdom. And so then you're, they're they're coming from a, a biblical worldview and you've got your bible at the center of things and they're they're helping you to apply god's word to your situation in your own life and that's wisdom because the bible clearly states that there's there's wisdom and and counsel right and so we don't do things alone so i think community plays a huge role in this biblical community where people have solid worldview they know their bibles and they they have experience that can you can benefit from that builds up mm -hmm. and equips the body in, in unity and and helps us to minister and live life mm -hmm. so. yeah community is so important like you said to make sure you're not siloing yourself and you get all these you don't have wrong ideas of how to navigate the world because surely there's somebody out there who ex experienced it, a similar that's right experience that you have and they can help like navigate and tell you what to do and you know what not to do you know right learn learn from my mistakes please uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't i don't want to watch other people drive their life into a ditch i've mm -hmm. done that it's not it's not fun i've survived but you know pull people aside and say you know this is what i've experienced you know this is the wisdom that i gleaned from it take take from it what you will that benefits, you know, this is what God taught me. And this is what it says in his word. And this is how I learned those lessons because I wasn't following God's word. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't exercising discernment or I made a foolish decision and I learned I needed to gain wisdom. And through my foolishness, by God's grace, I gained some wisdom. <laughs> so sometimes foolishness, well, you'll gain some wisdom usually right. through the, the, um, the uh, results of our foolishness will teach mm -hmm. us. So, yeah. So now that we know, like, what is a biblical worldview and kind of how to navigate it, mm -hmm. to, you know, different challenges that we might have, why is it important for us as believers to have it in our culture today? Um, that's a great question. I, I truly believe that um, worldview training, uh, Christian worldview training in the church is, is not an elective anymore um it's been treated like that as oh you got your apologists your worldview they're into that stuff and maybe you're into something else no actually in the current um situation that we find ourselves particularly in the west is that we live in a post-christian society aaron wren would call it a christian negative world mm -hmm. where um, christianity um in a positive world you know 60 years ago, if you were a Christian, it was a social, you know, plus it was like, oh, you're a Christian. Right. Oh, you're trustworthy. I'll bank with you or I'll, you know, mm -hmm. shop with you or um, trust you in a business deal or whatever. And then we went to a, a Christian neutral world about, say, 30 years ago where, you know, it was neutral. You're a Christian. I'm a Buddhist. We can mm -hmm. get along. You know, that's fine. And now we're in a Christian negative world where it's a, a, a social negative to be a Christian in a lot of places, maybe not here in Texas as much as some other areas of the country. Um, right. But where it comes in is that we, if we understand that and we understand the times in order to respond appropriately to the times, so we have to be like the men of Issachar and, and um, Chronicles that understood the times in which they lived to, to know what Israel ought to do is that we have to be like those men or sons of Issachar and, and understand our times. So what that means is that we're understanding now that that biblical worldview is not just a one hour training session on worldview. We can do that, but that's kind of compartmentalizing it as a part of an option on a 
like in a cafeteria, like right. some people like green beans, some people like carrots. I'll have the carrots. I don't like green. beans. It's not that it's a part of the story. And the importance of it is, is that I believe that the greater um, non-Christian pagan culture, and that could be a lot of different worldviews. Let's just say the anti-Christian or the non-Christian culture is narrating a story and people believe a good story. They want to believe a story that, oh, you know, if we just do these things, the world will be a better place. And um, if I just say these things, then my life will be better. And, you know, I'm not the problem with the world. It's the systems out there that are problem the world. I was born good. You know, these type of things that that people believe rather than saying, I'm born a sinner and I'm the problem with the world, you right. know, uh, you, you know, you think everything's outside. So that, that then creates a worldview where, um, every, everybody's the bad guy and you're the good guy. And it's like, wait a second, I'm the bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> We're all the bad guy. Right. And, and, but I think the importance of the biblical worldview is that there's a story that's being told to people out there. That's it's, it's a strong story, but it's a wrong story. Mm. And we have the true bigger overarching story that encompasses all story, creation, fall, redemption, restoration, Jesus Christ at the center of it. He is risen at the center of total reality that if we would just learn how to articulate and tell that bigger story, we just out narrate the culture, right? We just out narrate them. Say, wait a second. This is the, you, these people are believing a lie and a really bad story that doesn't end well. Why aren't we telling the story of a God of the universe who created all things and that it, that, that he in fact is telling a story and it is a true story that Jesus did die for our sins and that he rose from the grave and that you can be forgiven and that you don't just invite Jesus into your heart, which isn't biblical. It, he, he invites you into his life, right? Like that's theologically sound that he invites you in his life because then he raises you to life to then do what? Well, Ephesians 2 10, your workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works mm -hmm. that were created beforehand that you would walk in them. So that gives you the reason why you were saved that he has something for you. And then once you can share that God loves me, and that he saved me and that not only that, that he has something that he's designed for me to do in this world for him. And it's only, I'm going to be able to do it, but it's going to be through his power. Go figure mm -hmm. that out. Right. You know, it's, that just blows your mind mm -hmm. and that yet he loves me and I'm going to stumble. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to hurt people. I'm going to sin, but that's not going to change his love for me because right. he saved me. And all I have to do is believe and, and, and just walk in faith and, mm -hmm. and be obedient to what he commands. And that that's a testimony to the unbelieving world. Like that's such a powerful story and that he's going to restore all things. Read the end of the book. Right. Behold, I'm going to make all things new. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we have the better story. That sounds better than any utopia or any nihilism type of idea that we're just going to when we die, nothing happens and we go into oblivion or any of those which are untrue. I gosh, I'm like, wait a second, I'm here for a reason. Oh my gosh. And that God, out of billions of people throughout all of history, that God saw me and he loved me and he sent his son to die for me. And that gospel, that proclamation changes everything. That if I believe and then walk in that obedience of, okay, Christ, you saved me, but what's out there? What do you want me to do? You know, yeah. um, waking up every morning going, okay, God, what, what's, what's on, I know what I've got obligations, obviously I got to pay bills, right. take care of family, stuff like that. But what, what, what do you, what do you have in store for me? Uh -huh. Yesterday wasn't such a great day. I, I've messed up here and I sinned here and, but no, today's a new day. Your mercies are new every day and you have something for me. So you give people that story and it gets Christians even get excited. They're like, right. I mean, God has mm -hmm. something. I don't just wait to go to heaven. I've got my mm -hmm. ticket out. Of, well, it, no, <laughs> read the end of the book again. Uh, this is mm -hmm. our home. God comes yeah. and dwells with us, but he has something for you to do. And then when you see somebody really grasp that, that God loves them and that he has a mission for them. 
and that every that they can have purpose and dignity and value and impact in every single moment of their life to the glory of God, it changes mm-hmm. the whole dynamic. Yeah. So that you can see, I get excited about that. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> that is exciting. Yeah. Because the battle is already run, won. That's right. That's right. We're, we're fighting a defeating, defeated foe. And most of the times we are our own misgivings, our own sin, our own deception. Mm-hmm. A friend of mine says we're self-deceived deceivers. We deceive ourselves into believing that somehow we're going to lose. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. now I'm sorry. That's I, that's <laughs> back to community that we need mm-hmm. community to say, look, right. we're not losers. We're, we're winners. And yes, right. there's going to be darkness. And but the gates of hell will not prevail against mm-hmm. the church. These yeah. it's And so gates are stationary. <laughs> the church mm-hmm. moves. So, OK, what are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be on the march. And okay, what does that look like? Well, you, you need to get in community, read your Bible, and asking God, okay, God, what is it you would have me to do in this life? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and everything in His hands that we give to Him for His glory, He will use. And it could be small, like he, it's in God's word. It says, you know, a, a, a cup of water given in my name, a cup of water. Mm-hmm. given in his name, a, a, an encouraging word. You just never know what you can say or what you do just in the normal routine, you know, day and moments of life that you, you've had an impact on somebody's life until they come back to you 20 years later and said, you remember when you said blah, blah, blah. And you're like, mm-hmm. no, <laughs> and you're like, well, it blessed me and it changed um, the trajectory of my yeah. life. And you're like, Mm-hmm. praise God, because that's, yeah. you give the credit to him because you can't even remember sometimes, you know, that will happen, right. you know? Yeah. So I think that's the biblical, the worldview in action. I think that's the important of it because it's not just a set of beliefs in this theoretical thing, even though that's, you, you have that to be able to teach it. But at the end of the day, it's something that you live in and you live out. And I think once people get that, it's it's very attractive to an unbelieving world that's looking for hope, particularly now. Right. And for Christians, it just it's energizing. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Amen to that. Yeah. All right. So what resources could you recommend to help people like straighten their worldview? Um, well, I think there's there's great books out there as as a kind of one of my favorite kind of um sort of overview is um, um, uh, John Stone Street and Brett Kunkel's uh, Practical Guide to Culture. Mm -hmm. So that's a great like overview, Christian worldview, what we're to be about. A couple of, another couple of books that I really love. If you want to go deeper into the, like the academic side of worldview, um, uh, Chuck Colson and Nancy Piercy wrote a book. um, It's probably... 25 years old, but it's called How Now Shall We Live? Mm -hmm. Great book. And it gets more into the nitty gritty of worldview, Um, gets into the kind of how things work out. It's a it's a bigger book than the um, practical guide to culture. Mm -hmm. And um, there's also I always um, recommend um, folks is they're diving into worldview, well, where do you start? Well, go to the word of God, right? Of course, yeah. And spend a bunch of time in Genesis one and two, because that's before the fall and do a deep dive study of Genesis one and two to understand what the world was before Mm -hmm. sin entered it. And there's a lot there that I think and I gloss over it, but a couple of years ago, I was teaching a, a worldview, uh, a course called Culture in the Christian Worldview at my church. And I started in Genesis 1 and 2 and decided to spend like three weeks there, just just spending time in God's word and like, okay, I want to really know what all this means because I've glossed over it, over it. And you get to the fall and then you you bust through the rest of the Bible and you get to redemption, the gospels, and then yeah. revelation, you know how it goes. Uh-huh. And there was a book by Christopher Watkin um, called Thinking Through Creation, Genesis 1 and 2 as, as cultural critique. And so I, a friend of mine gave me this book 
And so I started reading through it while I was reading through Genesis, and it was really helpful in drawing out the the bigger implications of Scripture, further than just application to your daily life, because it's really hard to, to apply Genesis 1 and 2 to your daily life. Like, what the heck does that mean? Um, but when you see how God created the world and all of this, um, and it was good, and that he put all of this latent potentiality kind of buried underneath the surface for human beings to mm -hmm. develop. You're like, wow, you know, he, there was gold there and there were aromatic resins, there was food and, you know, Adam's naming animals, which then creates this authority structure where you get the first form of governance. And like you start drawing these things out, you're like, wow, when God created the world in these first two chapters of his word, they're very powerful. And then from there, that becomes the, from my perspective, and others may have different, so that becomes the launching pad into the biblical worldview is start out with, with God and how he's creating and what his creation was like, and then looking at the implications and drawing those out, you have to use, you know, uh, the Christian imagination and say, okay, what would have these things been like if the fall hadn't happened? And then when you come to the fall, you can start asking questions of the fall is like, you know, for marriage or something is like, well, what is, what is marriage? You know, Genesis one and two, a, a biblical picture of marriage, uh, you know, covenant between um, man, woman, and God three together. Mm -hmm. um, and okay. You get to the fall. How has the fall impacted it? Right. Yeah. Like, okay, wow. And okay, what does it mean to be a human being? How has the fall impacted that? What does that mean to be a man or a woman? How has the fall impacted that? And then you're able to draw out these further implications where brokenness and the fall have created the current situation we're in now, Yeah. whether it be war or famine or all these things. And they start to make sense. So you won't fully understand them because a, a lot of it's beyond us because it's in God's mm -hmm. <laughs> domain, right. but at least he's created reality in, in, in such a way that we can comprehend it. And that's such a beautiful thing. I can't imagine what life would be like if we couldn't comprehend reality. <laughs> it, it would be, well, there probably wouldn't be life. We would have <laughs> right. all, yeah, it would have been over at the fall, yeah. I think, or mm -hmm. Cain and Abel been ended it, been a, a war or something, but in any event, you know, some of these would be those three books were really helpful um, in world as far as like is as, as a recommendation for people diving into mm -hmm. worldview is start there with the practical guide. It's going to be talking about these books. I'll say deal with cultural issues, mm -hmm. but the biblical worldview is how we we see culture, because I think Andy Crouch said that um, his definition of culture is what humans make of their world. Like that's a pretty good definition. I mean, it's yeah. very simple, but it's profound mm -hmm. in that way that gets us away from calling the cult, putting the in front of things like, no, we are culture. Right. Um, yeah. You know, if you don't engage with culture, then you're actually creating a, a culture. So if we understand what those mean, but then the biblical worldview informs all that and it helps us, the culture helps us understand the biblical worldview because the entire Bible set in cultures. Yeah. And so I think that that's those three books are helpful. The practical guide, how now shall we live in thinking through creation and using Genesis as that starting point to de develop or sharpen a biblical worldview. Mm -hmm. All right. So g g recap and give us those titles. In the okay. Yeah. So the first book is uh, John Stone Street and Brett Kunkel. A Practical Guide to Culture. Mm -hmm. uh, the second book I would recommend is Chuck Colson and Nancy Piercy. Now, How Now Shall We Live? The third book is Christopher Watkins, Thinking Through Creation. Okay. And then, of course, Genesis being that, that launching point for, okay. for all of it. Yeah. Genesis 1 and 2. It's because Genesis is a big book. Like, oh, read Genesis. Right. Well, that's <laughs> we read Genesis, yes, but Genesis one and two being really the launching point for the biblical worldview. Okay, all right. So this has been a very helpful conversation as far as like looking at worldview and how we ought to, you know, view it through the Bible and truth and.
having some resources to kind of help guide us through. So to wrap up, what encouragement can you offer believers to live faithfully for Christ? Wow. Um, I think I, I always go to um, Acts 17, 26, that from one man, all nations of mankind, he created us in allotted um, times and periods of our dwelling. So God created us for a place and a time. And that Ephesians, you know, 2, 8, 9, and 10. So you have, um, for we are saved by grace through faith, not by works, thus any man should boast. But then it moves on to Ephesians 2.10, which which says that we're created as a workmanship in Christ Jesus for good works that mm -hmm. were created beforehand, that we should walk in them. So that gives us a mission, um, both individually. And then um, I think the encouragement is is understanding what it means to be a leader where Christians are called to be leaders. We're discipling, we're called a disciple. And when you're discipling someone, then you're leading. And if you're a child, maybe you're not discipling someone, but at some point you're called to go and make disciples. And that may be in your own family. So you will be leading, but in that leadership, I think Oz Guinness put this the best way that I, I can't articulate it any better. Um, cause we're all called to be leaders as Christians. Mm -hmm. Um, and he said, biblically from old Testament, new Testament, well, what is a leader? He said, a leader is someone who takes responsibility and initiative for the crisis or opportunity that's right in front of them. Mm. So that's what a leader does. And in doing so they're serving God's purposes in their generation. So he's calling to a generation, a time and a place. And so I think my encouragement for, for my brothers and sisters in Christ from this biblical worldview type of conversation is, is understand that you aren't responsible for changing the world. The times can be very, very frustrating. You can look politically, you can look globally, like social media is just, you know, yeah. coming at us from all directions with horrible things going on. Mm -hmm. In a matter of milliseconds, we can be bombarded with 50 different messages is what's right in front of me. It may be that grandchild. It could be your own children. It could be um, your parent. It's like, mm -hmm. what's the crisis or the opportunity that I can take responsibility and initiative for? And that's it. You know, that then do that. What's right in front of my face? Uh, the world's problems, I can pray about those. And there's some things that I can you know, be involved in to help. I can give to global missions. I can get involved politically or go teach in a school or whatever those things may be. But oftentimes it's right there, what's right in front of you. And if you think back to the first century Christians um, around Rome, that they were, they were ostracized, they were persecuted, um, they were hated because they would not bow the knee to, to Caesar. Now, they were good citizens. Otherwise, they just were not going to worship Caesar and they mm -hmm. called for the worship of Caesar. So what were they doing? They were putting in the arena and burning them at the stake, all mm -hmm. these horrible things. And so they were ostracized and on the edges of, of society. But what the Romans were doing um, to their baby girls were throwing them away is infanticide. They valued boys. Boys had value. Girls did not. And mm -hmm. so girls were thrown away. Um, but the Christian worldview came in and said, wait a minute, those little girls were created in the right. image of God. They have intrinsic value and worth mm -hmm. and, and we, we can't not go help them. So what they were doing is going into the dumps and into the forest where these baby girls were being just tossed away like um, garbage and taking them and adopting them. And if you do that long enough, it changes the culture because if you're, only valuing boys, then you only have boys. Well, where, where do boys where go to procreate from? and, and get, <laughs> yeah. get married? Well, they have to go to the church. Well, back then, you know, generally, if you wanted to marry, you, you, you had to convert and the conversion wasn't, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. Let me marry your daughter. It was, no, you're going to come into church. We're going to disciple you. Right. Um, we're going to catechize you. We're going to test you. And then after a few years, 
we will then, you know, baptize you if, based on your profession of faith. And we've seen you live by this. And then you can, you can marry, marry our adopted daughter. Right? right. And so you have this baby boom coming out of the church and you do that for, you know, enough decades, then your population just naturally mm -hmm. takes over. So that you had the fall of uh, Rome and the rise of Christianity, but none of those Christians at that point in time, believed that they were changing the world. They just went out and saw these babies, baby girls that were left out in the, in the, in the forest or in the, the city dumps. And they were saying, no, we're going to take, cause God said so that's, right. this is what Christians do uh -huh. and thus change the world. Um, William Morbeforce didn't set out to change the world. Mm -hmm. You know, these, yeah, these, <laughs> you, you know, they, they were enemies in a lot of, of the world. And so, you know, just do what, but that what they were doing was being faithful to what God had put right in front of them. And then that turned into these bigger things. And so it's small hinges swing big doors. That's why I always right. try to remember the Christian worldviews. Like you may be in your eighties, retired, not knowing what you can do as a Christian to change the world. Well, don't worry about it. Maybe it's just teaching a kid how to read before third grade, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Because if you can't read, you can't read God's word. And if you can't read before third grade, you can't read to learn and you can be exploited mm -hmm. your whole life. Then you're at the, the mercy, that child grown up who can't read that's illiterate is at the mercy of other people to be exploited. And so you've just, by teaching a kid to read, you've just lowered their vulnerabilities. Yeah. Amazing. You know, yeah. you do that for enough kids, you change mm -hmm. something. It could happen in a little school, in a classroom or in a city. And God uses those little acts of faithfulness. So that, you know, little retired lady that's in her eighties, teaching a kid to read is a small hinge that swings a big door because she teaches mm -hmm. a couple of kids how to read. You don't know what those kids are going to grow up right. to do. Don't. Who yeah. knows? So again, that's part of that bigger story. We don't tell. Yeah. that we should as Christians. Yeah, that's that's incredible encouragement. Well, Lance, thank you for being on the show. How can people like, get in contact with you or follow you? Sure. You? Um, I'm on Instagram, uh, Forge Room on Instagram, uh, at Forge Room. Um, I'm also at Lance underscore Cashin, C-A-S-H-I-O-N on Instagram. I'm kind of on Twitter. Uh, but it's kind of a mess over there Our usually. X, I think it's X now, right? <laughs> X, yeah, Twitter. I'm, see, I'm old school. Twitter. Um, but the main thing, uh, you can go to my, uh, the, our non website is theforgeroom.org. So it's forgeroom.org. And then um, I write uh, and blog and sometimes podcast on revolutionofman.org. So that's my blog site is revolutionofman.org. Okay. So that's probably the place where you can get the most content and stay in contact um, with me is through revolutionofman.org, um, my website. And yeah, I'd love to interact. And I, I try to make sure that if people message me, I get back in contact with them. There's just all these different platforms. I can't quite track them right. all. So sometimes it's, it's a little up. tough. So yeah, but that's how to stay in touch. But yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for, for having me on your, on your podcast. It's, right. it's awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks again. Yes, absolutely. So how we think and what we believe affects how we act and react in our world today. I pray this episode was helpful to understand a book worldview. And if it was helpful, please share with your family and friends. And until next time, remember, God is always good and he's always faithful. Thank you for listening to the podcast. Do me a favor by following the podcast and leaving a review to help spread the word. I look forward to hearing from you.